And now we take you to Evangel Assembly of God in Tallahassee, Florida, to another powerful, life-changing message. For more information, visit our website, evangelag.org. My name's Ryan. That's Andrea. Uh, we have the pleasure of serving here on staff as staff pastors for almost five years, and it's just been such a, a joy and a privilege to be able to come back. You know, if you're here for the first time and kind of kicking the tires, trying to figure out, you know, where's, where's home for you, uh, I would encourage you to give this place a try because this is, this is a great, great place uh, for you and for your family. You know, we, uh, uh, our last Sunday was, uh, I think, the first of May last year. And we began to feel the Lord tugging on our heart, beginning to stretch us a little bit, to take a step of faith and, and step out as lead pastors. And, and we did this thing. I don't know if you've ever done this before, but we prayed this prayer. We said, God, we'll go wherever you want us to go. Just open the door. And we didn't know he'd take us up on that. And uh, so God moved us 3,000 miles away, and all my life has been in the south, and so everything has always been up there. And so now we live 90 miles away from Canada, and everything's down there. And I'm so turned around, and I can't get uh, geographically situated. Uh, but it's been such a blessing. You know, one of the things for us that as we walk through the process, you know, we met with Pastor, we began to share with him what God was stirring in our heart, and he was so kind and gracious to kind of help us along that journey of trying to discover what is it, God, that you're tugging and pulling on our heart with. And, you know, through that process was a time of, of trust, was a time of us uh, not trying to make things happen. How many know when we try to make things happen with God, oftentimes it gets us in trouble? And so uh, we did everything we could to, to pull back and to be patient and to wait for God to open the door. And the door that he opened for us um, was just amazing. You know, the church that we have the privilege of being able to pastor has 90 years of rich history. And uh, they had been through some difficult times. They had been in a 10-year decline um, where, you know, uh, uh, everything about the, the atmosphere, the morale, attendance, everything had been just in this constant 10-year decline. And uh, it's just been a perfect fit for us perfect fit for us. It's been awesome to see God's faithfulness and how when you're patient and you trust God, that although it doesn't always happen at the speed or the pace or even what you want God to do, that if you'll be faithful and trust in Him, that He'll work it out for your good and for your benefit. And it's just been a perfect fit for us. You know, we've seen a lot of great things happen over the last uh, 14 months. We have relocated into one of the most unchurched areas in the nation. And so, that has been an interesting, uh, interesting adjustment uh, to kind of develop and learn a different kind of, of culture. But one of the things that we are just, um, just so humbled at what God is doing there is that we've seen, and over the last 14 months, we've seen over 150 people make commitments to Christ, whether it's been through a... Whether it's been through a rededication or a first time commitment to Christ, and it has just been awesome. And this church has got a whole new kind of fresh breath of air that's flowing through it. People are inviting people to church and we're growing and things are happening. And it's just been such a, such an honor and a blessing to be able to be a part of that. And you guys have a part to play in that. You know, for four and a half years, we sowed into you, but you guys sowed into us. And so now we're able to step out and to be lead pastors and we carry along with us the things that we've developed and learned in, uh, in our season here. You know, one of the things that I want to share this morning is a story about one of these uh, first time commitments. It was a family that, that uh, the father and the three kids, family of five, the father and the three kids ended up coming to church on a Sunday in October. They had gotten invited by a churchgoer uh, from our church, invited them to church, and so they came. And, and that first day, that first Sunday that they showed up, he's struggling. He's an alcoholic. He's a drug addict. You know, the kids are kind of the byproduct of all that stuff that's going on in the house. And they come, and they're in the service that October, and God gets a hold of his life in such a way that after the service, he comes to me in the foyer, and he says, I just felt this like bolt of energy or electricity flow through my body during the service. And all my hair started standing up on my arms and my body. And, and uh, I gave my heart to the Lord today. And 
That began a journey for this family over the next couple months. He was at church every single Sunday. His kids were coming. They gave their heart to the Lord and the kids' ministry. Uh, his wife ended up coming a couple months later. She had hurts from church. She had uh, issues with being able to trust people. And, and so as she began to see the life change that was happening in her husband's life and her kids' lives, she walks in the door a couple months later. She gives her heart to the Lord. And we were in January. We were doing the, the 21 day fast that, that you guys do here as well. And I remember we were about halfway through and it was a Wednesday night. And, uh, during that semester of groups, we were doing meals before the service started. And so Andrew and I made our way over to their table and we sat down and we just started talking about the awesome things of God. And they had this huge smile on their face. And to give you an idea of the kind of culture that we live in, um, these are, are people that are now, you know, they're probably, I guess three months or so, they had been living for the Lord. God's been doing some awesome things in their life. And, and they said, Ryan, we, we've, we've, um, we're participating in this path, uh, fast and God is just doing so many awesome things. And so we asked them, we we're like, well, what are you guys fasting? And they said, we're fasting cigarettes and marijuana. <laughs> Cause in Washington, marijuana is legal. So, um, <laughs> and so we're like, we're like, that's great. That's great. And, you know, in that moment, we had a choice. We had a choice of either starting to put uh, restrictions on them and rules or a choice of starting to love them. And so what we chose to do is we chose to allow the Holy Spirit to do the convicting and for us to just love on them through the journey. And so it's just been an awesome time. Now these guys are they're faithful members of our church. They're serving in all kinds of different areas and God's doing awesome things in their life. And you know, it's just been, it's just, we've got story and story and story that's like that of just how God is taking over and transforming people's lives. And uh, it's just been awesome to be a part of that. You know, this morning, what I want to do is I want to talk to you a little bit about what I think is something that's super simple. It's something that all of us have probably heard before, but it's so crucial to our walk with God and us discovering God's purpose and plan for our life, that oftentimes we overlook it, and sometimes we even think it's too good to be true. And so this morning, I want to talk to you a little bit about that. Father, we thank you for just an incredible time, your presence and what you're doing in our lives today. Lord, we ask you to, God, do a work in us, Lord. Today, give us a revelation of you. And Father, we just open our minds, we open our hearts to receive Your Word. So Father, we thank You for all that You're going to do. In Jesus' name, Amen. So when I was growing up, a lot of you know my story. I was, uh, my parents were uh, drug addicts, and so I was all over the place living with uh, aunts and uncles. And uh, when I was in the fifth grade, I was living with my aunt and uncle in Colorado. And uh, these guys had two cousins that were younger than me, and they were outdoors people. You know, Colorado reminds me a lot of Washington because it's just all the mountains and the snow and all that stuff. And, and, uh, so they love the outdoors. They love to hike. They love to camp and they really love to snow ski. And so they, as I was living with them, they decided they were going to help me learn how to ski. And so they took me out to the, the bunny slopes, you know, the beginner slopes, the real little ones. And, you know, here I got my cousins. I'm in fifth grade and they're like third and second grade. And, you know, they're scooting all over the place because they've been skiing since they were really, really small, probably before they could walk. And so my uncle's here working with me. He's skiing backwards. I got, I'm in my skis and he's just kind of teaching me all the basics of it and, you know, eventually over time I started picking it up and I started getting a little bit more bolder. And so I transitioned to the green slopes and then I transitioned to the blue, which has the little moguls and stuff. And really was at a place where I was pretty comfortable because I would fall down some, but I could ski down. I could be fast. I could jump some of the hills. I could do all that. And then my cousins, as they started seeing me beginning to get a little bit better, they, they threw out the gauntlet. They challenged me to go with them down a black diamond. Now, if you've ever been snow skiing or know anything about it, you know the black diamonds, it's, it's up there. It's like the top of what you can do. And, and so, you know, I'm in fifth grade. I've got my cousins that are second and third grade and they've laid down the challenge. And what fifth grade is going to say no to that kind of a challenge from his cousins? So I say yes. We, we jump on the lift. We go up to the top of the mountain. I remember getting off of the chair and we kind of scoot around and you come to the edge of the mountain and it's like, 
There's no more mountain, right? It's like you see where you're supposed to start and then it drops off. And so I get up to the edge and, and get my breath together, you know, and I'm just kind of preparing myself. And so then I start and I go left and I, I'm like not going really downhill. I'm just going side to side. And so I work side and I work side and I get, I don't know, about a quarter of the way down and I hit this patch of ice and my skis go out from under me and I start sliding down the hill face first. And so I finally get my ski locked into the side of the hill and I get stood up. You know, my other ski is over here and, and my, my uh, poles are over here. And so my cousins had skied down. They're on these little, this is back then where they had these like little skis that were like this big and they would ski on those things. And so they got the skis, they brought them up, gave them to me. I got locked in and I remember this like it was yesterday. I got locked into my skis, got my poles in my hand, getting ready to start the left and the right and the left. And all of a sudden I hear, watch out. And this guy comes plummeting through, takes my legs out from under me. And I go down the rest of the black diamond on my stomach. And so that was my experience of, of skiing a black diamond. I haven't done it since then. Um, but what I can say is that I accepted the challenge. You know, I think inside of every single one of us, we have a, a desire to, to take the challenge. Some of us like big challenges. Some of us like some of the smaller challenges that we feel like aren't so much of a challenge. But all of us typically like challenges. And and what I think is probably one of the biggest challenges is climbing Mount Everest. I don't know if you've ever seen a picture of Mount Everest. I got a picture up here on the screens. Mount Everest is 29,000 feet high. That's over 84 times as high as the Capitol building downtown. That's pretty tall. For Everest, uh, the temperature there in the summer, it's kind of similar to Florida in that it averages around negative 2 degrees Fahrenheit. In the winter, it averages around negative 32 degrees Fahrenheit. Only 4,000 people have summited Everest. Only 4,000 people have ever been able to get to the top of Everest, and 282 people have died trying. You know, the most dangerous area of Everest is what's called the South Summit to Hillary Step. And this is a picture of that. And it's the most dangerous kind of trek up to the top of Mount Everest. And on one side, you've got uh, 10,000 feet down Tibet. And then on the other side, you've got 7,000 feet down is Nepal. And then everybody's got ropes that are tied to them that help them to be able to make it to the top. You see, without the rope, without them being connected to everybody else, there's no way that they're going to be able to make it up the top with all the the ice that they're walking on, with all the high winds at that kind of altitude. And out of the 4,000 people that have ever made it to the top, the one that really stands out to me the most is a guy by the name of Eric Wehenmeyer. Say that three times real fast. Wehenmeyer. And I want to introduce you to him. This is Eric. Eric's an American who successfully summited Mount Everest back in May of 2001. And what you won't notice about Eric is the fact that Eric has been blind since he was 13. So as a blind man, he's known as the first person and the only person to date that has ever summited Mount Everest and to be blind. And when he was asked how he could climb Everest being blind, he replied, he said this, the idea seemed crazy at first, but he said, even when the wind was howling so much that I couldn't hear the footsteps crunching in front of me, I always had the direction of the rope to follow. You see, for Eric and also for every other climber that attempts to get to the top of the mountain, the rope is the one thing that gives them the chance. Being connected to the rope is really their lifeline. And it's their faith in the strength of the rope that gets them there. See, for someone like Eric, whose eyes aren't there to guide him, the only thing that he can rely on is what he hears with his ears and what he can feel and touch in the rope. For Eric, he and his friends are all joined to the rope, and it's the tension of their movement upward that helps Eric determine what steps he has to take. You see, it's the feeling of the rope that helps him to be able to prepare for the danger that's ahead. 
When somebody trips and falls, he can feel the tug. He can feel the change in the rope. And so for Eric being blind, the only way that he can make it to the top is by him trusting in the rope and holding on. You see, the rope is his guide. It's his guide in the midst of a very dangerous journey. And for Eric, it's the rope, not his senses, that is the one thing that won't fail him when he's uncertain of which step to take. And in a spiritual sense, we're all blind like Eric. We struggle to see what lies ahead. We struggle to see the obstacles that we're going to face five months from now or a couple years from now or maybe even next week. You know, we struggle to know of our footing and the direction that we're walking in life of whether that's the way that we should go or whether it isn't. You know, just like Eric, Eric has some steps that are great. They're easy. It's a walk in the park. But then some of his steps are on ice and shell on a cliff 7,000 feet down this side and 10,000 feet down this side. But did you know that just like the rope that didn't fail Eric, there's a spiritual rope that doesn't fail us. And that's what I want to talk to you about. It's the rope of God's love. So if you got your Bibles, turn with me to Romans chapter 8. And I want to take a few minutes and talk about this love. And while you're making your way there, I want to tell a little backstory. The book of Romans is a letter written to Christians in Rome who were facing an increasing persecution. They were walking through and kind of struggling with these misunderstandings of, of what following Christ was all about. You know, they were fear, fearful of the, that God wouldn't like them, that God would judge them of, of their se- uh, sins. They felt God wanted to, to really rob them of the joys of life. And they felt that if they got into trouble, if they did the wrong thing, that God would just leave them and take off. And so Paul addresses this misunderstanding of God's love with a question that we all tend to wrestle with at some point in our life. And the question is this, In verse 35, it says, Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Paul says, Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Have you ever wondered that? Have you ever been in the midst of something that you're you're facing, maybe a difficult season? Maybe it's a a, a mistake that you've made that you regret, and you kind of look back and you just... You feel like that mistake that you've made or, or, or you've fallen short in that area or that sin that you've committed or that promise that you've broken is, has gotten you to this place to where God's way over there and He's kind of looking down on you and, he, and He's judging you and, and He's looking at you and all He's doing is calling out the bad things and all He's doing is calling out the shortcomings and the mistakes. And, and so oftentimes in life we can get to this place to where we walk through difficulties and, and our understanding or perception of God's love is that, that He's over here and my sin and, and the yuckiness of what I'm walking through in my life has separated me from that. And he goes on, he says, does it mean that, that He no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or, or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? Now I want you to see what Paul's response is. He says, no. He says, absolutely not. And here's what this means for you and me today. It means that God knows the worst about us, but get this, He chooses to concentrate on the best about us. Did you catch that? God knows the worst about us. Right now, God knows every bad thing that I've ever done, every bad thing that I will do. He knows the yuckiness about me, but He chooses to concentrate on the good in me. And God does the same thing for you today. That whatever the yuckiness is and whatever the things that you kind of look at your life and and feel like disqualify you from God's best in your life, God God doesn't focus on that stuff. God focuses on the good and the potential and what lies within you. And God's invested and interested in your journey of helping you become all that He's designed you to be. Do you know why He does this? He does it because His love for you and me is rooted in His choice for us, not our choice for Him. Big. That's huge for us to understand and have a revelation of. 
That God's love for us is rooted not in our choice for Him because we made a decision to accept Him into our life, but in His choice for us. That before we even made the choice, before we even knew anything about God, that God had already chosen us. And His love is rooted in that. You know, think about that. The all-knowing, the eternal, the all-powerful God chose you. He chose you. And because He chose you, there's nothing that you can do that will ever cause Him to stop loving you or to ever change His mind about you. And then look what Paul says next in verse 37. He says, no, despite all these things. So despite all the other stuff over here in your life that's not so great and all the stuff over here in your life that's not so great and then all the stuff that's in this little box that nobody knows about but you and God. He says, despite all of that stuff, look what he says. He says that we are overwhelming or we have overwhelming victory that it's ours through Christ who loved us. So he's saying nothing... None of this stuff that's in your life that's on the periphery, all the stuff that you worry about every day and the stuff that keeps you from God's purpose in your life, that none of that stuff matters. That despite all of that, and that word despite to me is important because that means He knows that you're going to make mistakes and fall short. Right? That word despite means He knows beforehand that we're going to fall short, that we're going to miss the mark. And He says despite all of that stuff, He says overwhelming victory is ours. And that phrase in the, in the Greek is, is awesome because it's one Greek word that's kind of split up from, from two words. And we've got that up on the screens. It's hooper nikeo. And hooper means to a greater degree. Nikeo means victorious. That's the word where they got Nike from. And so here's, which is true. <laughs> but here's what he's saying. He's saying the game is rigged in your favor. He's saying you're, you don't just have victory. You know, victory would be the last second field goal when, when it, you know, the score's tied, you're down by two, and, and you hit the last second field goal, and you run off the field, and you're like, you know, everybody's arms are in the air, and you're shouting, and everything's great. That's victory. But he's saying overwhelming victory. He's saying to a greater degree. So let me explain what that's like. All right, so let's say we took Florida State football, and we took all the best players in the history of Florida State football. If you're a Gator fan, you don't know what that's like because you haven't had that great of players. But um, <laughs> I'm playing, kind of. <laughs> By the way, we've got some Florida State fans in Washington now. Now that they know I'm a fan, they've started following, following Florida State, which has been cool. They come to me on Sundays. It's like, wow, did you see that game? Did you see that play? So imagine we took FSU best players in history and we created this all-star team. So you got offensive players like Jameis Winston and Charlie Ward at QB. You got their hitting receivers like Peter Warwick and Fred Bolitnikoff and Ron Sellers. And they're handing the ball off to guys like Warwick Dunn and Devonta Freeman. And, and then you beef up the defense with guys like Deion Sanders and Ron Simmons and Derek Brooks and Terrell Buckley and Marvin Jones and Andre Wadsworth. And we set up a full contact football game against the Tallahassee Pee Wee League. <laughs> Few things I know would happen. One is that Florida State would score on every possession. The second thing is the Pee Wee team would have negative probably a thousand yards of offense. And number three is that there would be a lot of crying on the field. <laughs> and it wouldn't be coming from the FSU players. You see, it would be an unfair matchup, right? It would be an unfair matchup from the very beginning. And that's what Paul is saying about us being overwhelming and having overwhelming victory. That it's not a last second field goal in your life where you're just like, man, if I could just make it, if I can make the right decision right before I pass away, I'm good. You know? I mean, I can't tell you how many people I've come across in my life that that's the fear that they have is that they're going to pass away right as they're making a, a bad decision and, and they're in hell and they're lost for eternity. No, he's saying your life is not like a last second field goal. 
It's not about you trying to just barely get across the the finish line at the end. He's saying that we have overwhelming victory. He's saying when we understand God's love for us and what He's designed inside of us and, and the purpose and the plans that He has for our life, how He's created us, that it's not about a last second field goal. It's an overwhelming victory that there's really no competition that even though we go through difficulty in our lives and things don't work out the way that we hope that they will work out, that doesn't change the fact that we have overwhelming victory. And I think the problem oftentimes with us is because we have a difficulty believing in that. You know, gospel means good news. It's kind of the good news that's too good to be true. And, and it's, it's that kind of news that, that we feel like there's no way that we could be overwhelming victors in Christ. And so we struggle all of our life and and we have these difficulties and we try to pick ourselves back up again. And then then we walk through these seasons of of just kind of almost depressed and regret and shame of of the decisions that we've made. And and what's happened is, is we are making the choice instead of joining the right team, we are choosing to join the peewees. Instead of taking our kind of position in Christ... And playing on the team that God has designed and wired us and built us for, we're choosing in the midst of the game to choose the the lesser of the two and to choose to to play for the peewee team. And so Paul is is trying to, to make this point here that despite all the disappointment in life, despite the headaches in life, despite the difficulties, despite the mess ups, get this, that, that God loves you Period. That there's no other grammatical, and I'm not an English guy, but there's no comma there, there's no semicolon. It's a period. That God loves us, period. That it doesn't matter what all is happening around us. Look what he says in verse 38. He says, and I'm convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. He's saying there's nothing that you can say or do that will change my mind. Paul's saying I'm resolved deep on the inside. I'm convinced that I can have a bad day and that doesn't mean God doesn't love me. That I can make a, a decision back when I was a teenager that now I have to live with the rest of my life, but that doesn't mean that God doesn't love me. That I could take a, a step out of, of faith. I could start a business and, and it just tank and it fall in. And now my family's kind of walking through a difficulty. And that doesn't mean God doesn't love you. You can, college students, you could, you could choose the wrong major, right? And you can be $40,000 in debt down the wrong major and you could change your major and it doesn't mean that God doesn't love you. <laughs> that God loves us, period. And here's what the significance is about this statement. So you remember the story about Eric. That he was bound by this unbreakable rope. He was connected to his friends in the mountain. His his hands were free to, to work with the tools, to interact with the surface. He was able to grab his water bottle. The rope is wrapped around him, and it's not going to break. He may slip, he may fall, he may even pass out from the extreme conditions. But the rope will never let go of him. You see, Romans 5.8 says, But God showed His great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. Listen to this. That if the sin of all mankind wasn't so much or too great to keep Jesus from dying on a cross, why would we think that our sin individually would be too much for Him to continue loving us? That if God could send His Son to die on a cross for the sins of all humanity, then He could surely lean in and love us when we make difficult decisions in our life. And we walk through seasons that don't work out the way that we hoped. And I love how Paul clarified it even further in 2 Timothy 2.13, one of my favorite Scriptures. If we are unfaithful, 
He remains faithful, for He cannot deny who He is. And this is one of my favorite verses because it takes all the pressure off of us having to be perfect. It takes all the pressure off of us having to make all the, the right decisions and fearful of, of dropping the ball and making mistakes. See, no matter what we do or what we don't do, no matter what poor choices we've made in our past or all the poor choices that we'll make in our future, the rope of God's love will always hold on. And just like Eric on Mount Everest, who was guided by this rope, even though he went through terrible storms and was unable to see what was ahead of him, you too are held firmly by the unbreakable rope of God's love. Let me say it like this. As parents of three kids, we've never told our kids that they're not going to have difficult times. We've never told them that, that, that their bad mistakes and all that stuff is, is, is kind of kicks them out of the family. You know, they're going to make mistakes and they do. And they're going to, they're going to kind of give us attitude and they do. And, and they're going to, they're going to walk away and, and not want anything to do with us in that moment. And, and they do. But none of that impacts our love for them. And, and watch this. It doesn't because they didn't choose us. We chose them. We chose them as our kids. And because we chose them, they can do whatever they want. They can even as go as far as disrespecting us and, and we'll discipline them. But you know, Scripture talks about God disciplines those that He loves. Discipline is part of love. But there'll be nothing that they could ever do that would separate us from loving them. And that's what it's like in your life. God never promised us that our life would be trouble free, but He did promise us that, that those troubles will never separate us from God's love. And in verse 38, and whoever's doing the keys, you're welcome to come up. In verse 38, it says, Neither death nor life, Neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or the earth below, indeed nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. And here's why it's so important for you to grasp and have a revelation of God's love for your life. Ephesians 3, 18 through 19 says, And may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high and how deep His love is. And may you experience the love of Christ though it is too great to understand fully, then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. You see, the enemy of our soul bombards us on a daily basis with thoughts and, and feelings of inadequacy and guilt and shame condemnation, insufficiency, insecurity, fear, doubt, rejection, all in an effort to try to paralyze us and to keep us from walking in the fullness of our purpose and potential in Christ. You see, all those things in your life are designed on purpose. They're designed on purpose to try to create a separation between you and God. To make you feel like God's love for you is like riding a roller coaster. 
than in your down days and your down seasons that God's distant and he doesn't want anything to do with you. But, but when you're at church every week and you're serving, you're part of a group, man, he's all in in your life. And, and so we go in this roller coaster of life to where bad times and God's distant and good times and God's close. And, and we go back and forth and, and we live this life kind of disconnected from our true purpose and what God has designed us for. You see, without a deep revelation of God's love for you, period, you miss out on what the scripture says, being made complete and living a life that's full of the power that comes from God. You see, I've learned this in my life, that I will never allow God to lead me unless I realize how much he loves me. That I'll never allow God, I'll never allow Him to be in the driver's seat of my life unless I fully believe that He loves me. And the reason why is because trust is a byproduct of our revelation of love. And so as we walk through our life and we struggle with, am I going to be all God's called me to be or am I just going to kind of live the status quo in my life? And, and if we don't have a firm grasp of God's love for us, then we never put our trust in Him that when He begins to tell us to take a step here or to take a step here, that, that we feel pulled back. It's, and maybe it's too big for us. Maybe that's just not the way that, that I'm wired or what I can do. You see, for me, if you would have seen me 20 years ago, you would know that Standing in front of people is one of my biggest nightmares. The idea of being in ministry and the idea of, of speaking God's word and being in front of people all the time and, and talking is not inside. It's not, it's not part of my personality. It's not part of who I am. But if I wouldn't have put God in the driver's seat, if I wouldn't have understood that his love for me is so deep that I could trust him, even in the areas of my life that are fearful, that he'll come through, that if he loves me, period, then he's never going to ask me to do something that's going to hurt me. That anything that he challenges me to do and anything that he calls for me to do, that it's always for my good. And so my challenge to you today is to understand the depth of God's love for you. That there's nothing that you can do that can separate you from his love. It's there. He chose you. You didn't choose him. And because he chose you, he's got the best plans in store for you. That all you've got to do is to yield your life to him and to put your trust in him and allow him to lead the way. Will it be easy? Will it be a piece of cake? No. But boy, will it be fruitful. And it will be the best life that you ever dreamed that you could have. Because when you're in God's purpose and plan for your life, you're right in the spot of why he designed you. You're making a difference in the lives of your family and you're making a difference in the lives of those around you. And you've got this completeness in God and as scripture said, this fullness of life that only comes through Christ. You see, for Eric, Eric understood the importance of trusting the rope. It was his trust in the rope that enabled him to reach peaks in his life that only that no real blind person ever dreamed of and that even sighted people could hardly imagine. And friends, if you will put your trust in the rope of God's love, then you too will experience peaks in your life that you never thought was unimaginable because God's in control, not you. Father, we thank you for your presence here today. God, we thank you for the rope of your love. That God, there's nothing that we've done to deserve it. There's nothing that we can do to lose it. That God, you chose us. We didn't choose you. And so Father, today I pray over your people that God, you would give them a revelation of your love. That Father, they would understand that whatever is in their rear view mirror, that Father, whatever they regret, the shame of their past, that God, nothing can separate them from your love. And that God, you've got a plan and a purpose for their life. It's beyond anything that they could ever imagine or hope for. 
And so, Father, I pray over your people and I pray over this house that, Father, they would yield the leadership of their life to your Holy Spirit and that, God, you would do more than they ever thought could be done. Father, we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. We pray right now that God uses this message to plant good eternal seeds deep into your soul. For more information, visit our website, evangelag.org. Evangel's all about making the name of Jesus famous and His church glorious. We love God, love people, and love life. And we're here for you, working to help draw people from impossible situations into a loving and friendly circle of hope where answers are found and acceptance is given. We invite you to join us for any of our services, Sunday mornings at 1030 and Wednesday evenings at 7. We're located at 2300 Old Bainbridge Road in Tallahassee. We have fantastic programs for kids and youth and small groups to make deeper connections. And we pray that God blesses you richly and abundantly as you continue to seek Him first in all of your life.